Hello everyone. Um, here with uh, another talk for you. Um, we are going to get into kind of a, a, a new portion of the class here. We're going to be talking about homeostasis for several lectures. So now we're starting to um, dial in to the animals a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, start talking about some specific things and showing um, you know how they work. Uh, start tying together a lot of the things that we've been talking about so far. Um, and so this first part is uh, salt and water balance and homeostasis in general. So let's get to work. And so, uh, like I said, we're going to talk about the basic idea of homeostasis and then start talking about salt and water balance. And then in the next lecture, we're going to talk about excretory organs. So homeostasis is maintaining a constant internal environment, right? Um, you know, stasis, same, homeo, um, I guess within. There are two main things that try to disrupt the internal environment of an animal. Metabolic processes, processes and the external environment. And so these are two things that are constantly trying to disrupt that internal environment. Homeostasis is the organism's response to try to maintain that constant internal environment. Well, my metabolic processes are Again, it's one of those things that's just sort of, it's obvious that it needs to be done, right? To live, organisms must constantly take things in from their environment for metabolism, right? That's one of the things we use to help to define life, is that they can uh, harvest energy from other things in their environment. Uh, but you need lots of stuff from your environment that's constantly being taken in. Oxygen, nutrients, salts, water. All of these things need to get inside your cells so that you can carry out those chemical reactions that keep you alive. At the same time, those same processes are creating wastes that must be returned to the environment. Carbon dioxide, excess nitrogen, excess water. And so these are things that must take place if you're going to be alive, but they are also a challenge to the internal environment. It's hard to keep a constant internal environment if you're constantly taking in stuff and getting rid of other stuff. Then of course the external environment itself is also challenging and is also influencing the internal environment. And so temperatures change. Organisms can move from salt water to fresh water. Things like that all also are always changing you know either the organism moves around and its environment changes or the environment just changes you know sun comes up sun goes down so again these are things that are a necessary part of being alive yet they're changing and if we want a constant internal environment we need some mechanisms to um you know to act against the, these metabolic processes and this, these, the, the external environment. Well, why? How come we need a constant internal environment? That's a good question. Um, why not just go with the flow? And it's kind of a philosophical, broad question, uh, but there's also very practical reasons. Kind of not really philosophical, but a physical reason living things need a difference in potential to live. You need a difference of potential is a, is a term that comes from physics and like when you're talking about batteries and you talk about voltage and you, you know batteries have different voltages and that's really a difference in potential meaning that there's two things that are different in that battery it's the positive and the negative um, uh, uh, electrodes in that battery. And because of the chemicals that are attached to them, there's a difference in potential. And so that in the battery example, electrons really want to go from one electrode to the other because of the chemical reactions that are associated. And how badly 
those electrons want to flow, that's, a, that's voltage. That's a difference in potential. And it's the same sort of kind of idea with living things. You need a difference between the internal environment and the external environment to drive exchange with the environment and to drive these processes. Think back to um, when we talked about the electron transport chain. What was a, the whole point of the electron transport chain is we're going to pump protons to one side of a membrane so that they can flow through and as they move through back through that membrane they can charge up ATP and we can get them to do things. You know, but there was a difference in potential there. You had lots of protons on one side and fewer protons on the other side. And you see that everywhere when you're talking about life. And we need that. We need to use those differences of potential to do work for us, like making ATP. And so by creating a constant internal environment, that keeps you different from the external environment, which allows those processes to to take place that's kind of a big physical quote-unquote philosophical reason for maintaining an, a constant internal environment a more practical reason has a lot to do with your enzymes right and there's lots of practical reasons but a big one has to do with those enzymes again what's the main idea that that unites all living things. DNA makes RNA, makes protein. And most of the time, those proteins are enzymes. At least a lot of the time, those things are enzymes. And you remember the presence of those enzymes makes chemical reactions more likely to happen. They reduce the energy of activation. And without those enzymes, the chemical reactions that make you run wouldn't run. And so enzymes are critical to the life process. Well, remember, enzymes are proteins. What do we know about proteins? Shape, shape is so important. And what can influence shape? Temperature, pH, salt balance, all those things we're talking about when we maintain homeostasis. It's difficult to optimize the enzymes for a changing environment, right? Enzymes usually work optimally under a certain set of conditions, like a certain pH, a certain temperature. And it's easier to maintain those conditions than to make separate enzymes for each condition. You see what I'm saying? So for example, you know, you've got um, enzymes that work well at body temperature, 37C. And if your body heats up too much, those enzymes denature and they don't work very well. And if you get too cold, those enzymes don't work very well. And so it's not going to work. You can't get a protein that's going to work at all those different temperatures because temperature affects shape so much. And so you could produce different enzymes that are used at different temperatures. And to some extent that kind of happens, but that's really, it's, it's much more efficient to just maintain a constant internal environment. And then all your enzymes can be selected for that environment. And that's how it's worked through evolutionary time. So that's a real good reason to maintain a constant internal environment. It's just easier to optimize all those chemical reactions that you need to be alive. So that's why we need homeostasis. Okay, let's talk about another couple of uh, general concepts that are going to be very important to, to homeostasis. And the first we're going to talk about is a negative feedback loop. Most of homeostasis is based upon this idea of negative feedback loops. Well, what is it? A negative feedback loop returns to an equilibrium when perturbed. And so if you're at some equilibrium, whether it's temperature or pH or salt or water or anything that you need an equilibrium, if you move off that equilibrium, if you heat up, if you cool down, if the pH goes up, if the pH goes down, if the salt's concentration goes up, whatever, if you move off that equilibrium, a negative feedback loop will push you back to the equilibrium. So no matter what direction you go, if you go above the equilibrium or below the equilibrium, the negative feedback loop will push you back to that equilibrium. 
So the classic example of this is the thermostat in your house, right? So most thermostats would be set to around 21 Celsius. And um, so what happens if your house, you know, if it's cold outside and your house gets below 21? Well, the thermostat tells the heater to kick on and the heater kicks on and the house starts to warm up. And then when the house gets up to 21, the thermostat tells the heater to shut off. And then if it gets hot and the house rises above 21, the thermostat tells the air conditioning to kick on. And then the house cools down. And then when it gets back down to 21, the thermostat tells the air conditioner to kick off. And in that way, no matter which way you move off that equilibrium, you get pushed back to that original equilibrium. That's a negative feedback loop. Another example, this is an example I use all the time. This is Molly the Coon Dog. This is a puppy that I had back when I was in undergrad. And Molly's a sweet girl, good girl, but um, I did not take, an, I didn't take the time to train her to walk on a leash. And that's something I should have done. It's a good skill for them to learn, but I never did. So whenever we take Molly for a walk, I used a choke chain, one of those chains that gets tight around their neck. And so Molly wasn't well trained on the leash and she'd be so excited to go for a walk, she would pull so hard on that choke chain that it would start to cut off the blood supply to her brain, right? And so then she'd start to kind of get lightheaded and then so she would let loose on the choke chain. And then she'd realize, oh, I'm loose. And so she'd get excited and she'd pull again and then we'd start to tighten up and then we'd start to choke her off a little bit. And then at some point she found that equilibrium where she could pull against the chain, but it wouldn't cut off her supply. But if she moved off that equilibrium in either direction, she would move back to that equilibrium on her choke chain. So again, that's a negative feedback loop. If you got a negative feedback loop, then you have a positive feedback loop. Now these are not going to be as common, but they can be important. These push away from an equilibrium when perturbed, or they amplify the signal. So you're sitting at an equilibrium, and once you get pushed off that equilibrium, the positive feedback loop pushes you further from the equilibrium. And so it's like once you're, you're pushed off that equilibrium, then it amplifies, it goes out of control, and you go away from that equilibrium. Um, so a good example is uh, childbirth in humans, right? So there's a hormone called uh, uh, oxytocin. And as, as the baby is getting close to being born, the oxytocin levels rise. And so again, it's a hormone, it travels through the bloodstream. And one of the effects is it causes the uterus to contract, right? Which is gonna start to push the baby out. That pushes the baby's head against the woman's pelvis. And by pushing on that pelvis, that causes more oxytocin to be, re be released into the bloodstream. Well, of course, more oxytocin means the uterus contracts even harder, which means the baby's head pushes even more, which means even more oxytocin gets released. And you see how once this starts, it spirals out of control. It amplifies. And so you just keeps pushing harder and harder and harder. And then what's the end result? You know, the, the baby comes squirting out, right? And so you see how once you started off the equilibrium, then the positive feedback loop kept pushing you farther and farther from the equilibrium. Once you start, there's no going back. Positive feedback loops then will spiral out of control until you hit a new equilibrium, until, until there's something that radically changes. In this case, you know, you're being pushed off, then there's a childbirth, there's a radical change, or there's a new equilibrium, right? And so a positive feedback loop will push you until maybe something radical happens or other negative feedback loops kick in to establish a new equilibrium. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, another metaphor that we often use is a you know, a car sitting on top of a hill, right? Or you got two hills and a valley and there's a car sitting up there, right? Once you start to push that car off the top of the hill and it starts to roll down the hill, then it's gonna just pick up speed. Once you start and push it off that equilibrium at the top of the hill, then it's going to just take off. There's no coming back. Once it gets to the bottom of the hill, 
then it's going to kind of roll up the other hill and then kind of roll back and then roll back and then roll back and it's going to be at a new equilibrium at the bottom of the hill and if you pushed it up either hill it's just going to want to roll back and so at the top of the hill the positive feedback loop once you started there was no stopping at the bottom of the hill you're at a new equilibrium that holds it and and no matter what you're always no matter which direction you move you always go back to that original equilibrium so that's kind of the, another metaphor to use here the negative feedback loop is more common than the positive feedback loop and it kind of makes sense right if there were everything was a positive feedback loop you'd be just banging all over the place right the negative feedback loop is designed to maintain that constant internal environment so these are necessary for homeostasis okay so now let's start to put this these concepts into practice let's talk about basic salt and water balance um, and so if we're talking about salt and water balance then we also need to talk about diffusion and osmosis right so this is why we made such a big deal about those concepts earlier on in the semester because now we need to put them into practice right and so salts will diffuse down their concentration gradient if they can if they can't water will the free water will diffuse down its concentration gradient relative to the salt right and that's osmosis and so this is a basic problem that all living organisms face maintaining salt and water balance right and when we talk about salt we're not just talking about sodium chloride we're talking about salts we're talking about ion you know charged particles is what we're really talking about so it's easy to kind of think about this in animals if we think about the range of environments in which animals live on the planet okay and so you got animals that live in the open ocean out in the middle of the ocean of course there's lots of water and there's lots of salt and it's relatively constant as you approach the coastline you still have lots of water you're in the ocean you still have lots of water but you have varying levels of salt and because you've got fresh water coming in from all the rivers and so then you have what's known as brackish areas where you have varying salt concentrations and then as you move onto the terrestrial portion of the earth now you've got low salts and little water and so this is sort of like runs spans the gamut of environments that animals live in and so by studying animals in these different environments you can sort of see how animals regulate their salt and water you have different strategies depending upon where you live one strategy is the go with the flow strategy it's called an osmo conformer don't bother maintaining you know uh, regulating your internal environment just let your internal environment mimic the external environment and so you do have organisms that don't expend a lot of energy um, with homeostasis but usually those organisms live somewhere where it is a relatively constant environment so like the open ocean and so if you live in the open ocean where salt levels don't really change water levels don't really change then if you just conform to those salt levels and those water levels then you're going to be fine because those are never going to change and so let your internal environment mimic the external environment that would be an osmo conformer uh, in such a situation you would m most often be stenohaline meaning you can tolerate a narrow range of salinities well that's okay because you live somewhere where salinities don't vary much but if you did take that organism and and just move them a little somewhere where the salt but you know was a little bit more concentrated or a little bit less concentrated they would have a very difficult time that's stenohaline now uh, most organisms are osmoregulators meaning that they maintain an internal environment different from their external environment and in such a situation you might still be stenohaline or stenohaline however you want to pronounce it and so you still might only tolerate a narrow range of salinities but you also might be urihaline urihaline means you can tolerate a wider range of salinities so that's just a little vocabulary for you to know and so uh, let's uh, let's talk about this in, in some detail let's use fish as our model organism why 
Because fish exist in all types of water, right? From the open ocean to brackish water along the coastline to fresh water. And so you can see examples in all these different environments. Um, all vertebrates evolved from fish, or we have a common ancestor with fish. And so by studying fish, you get insight, you know, insight into other vertebrates because we have a common ancestor. And fish are awesome. So that's why we're going to talk about fish. So we've talked about this before already, right? A freshwater fish is hypertonic to its environment. It's saltier than the water around it because it's in fresh water. Consequently, salts are constantly leaking out. Sodium, potassium, chlorine. They're diffusing out anywhere they can because of simple diffusion, right? You've got a high concentration inside the freshwater fish, a low concentration outside. Salts want to diffuse from high to low. A lot of times they can't, though. A lot of, a lot of times they can't cross that membrane. And so you have water diffusing in. And you have osmosis with water coming into the freshwater fish. So they're constantly taking on water. And so we talked about this. A, a, a main strategy of the freshwater fish is to pee with very dilute urine. And so the dilute urine means that you've got lots of water, very few things dissolved in it, okay? Because you've got excess water. So just pee it to get, get rid of it. Another strategy of freshwater fish is to actively pump in sodium and chlorine at the gills. And so you've got specialized cells um, that, that pump these ions into the fish. But since you're going against the concentration gradient, this requires ATP. So you have to expend energy to pump those salts in because they passively leak out. Um, another strategy, another part of the strategy, is to take in salts through the food. And so you're constantly losing salt to your environment, but when you eat things, you replace those ions by things you eat. So these are all part of the general strategy of a freshwater fish. And that's what they're trying to show you here in this figure from your book. <clears throat> all the different ways that a freshwater fish, what we're looking at here is a yellow perch, all the different ways that this perch tries to maintain that internal salt and water balance. Now again, you need to pay attention when we talk about these things. Here, you know, it talks about active absorption of sodium chloride, active reabsorption of sodium chloride. The active is the important word here. That means your, you know, it's uh, active transport. You must use ATP to pump things against their concentration gradient. So that's why we made such a big deal about that earlier. This requires energy to pump these things in. And so, again, this is kind of part of the reason that, you know, animals have to eat, right? We have to constantly take in energy. Well, what do we use that energy for? You think about energy and taking in energy and you think about, you know, I'm moving and I'm running and I'm exercising and of course I need energy for that. But what you don't think about is all those other cellular processes that require energy. And this is an example. So here's a, another freshwater vertebrate, amphibians, and they do the same thing. They actively pump in sodium and chloride, but uh, you know, at the adult stage, they don't have gills, so they, they have these embedded in their skin. But again, it's, it's using ATP to pump those salts in because they're constantly leaking them out to the freshwater environment. Okay, and so when we talk about salt levels, what are they? In a fish, the rule of thumb, in a bony fish, so the kind of fish that you, you typically think of when you think of a fish, um, bony fish are about one-third the salinity of seawater. And so seawater is, rule of thumb, is about 35 parts per thousand salt. So PPT stands for parts per thousand. That's grams per liter. Fish blood usually runs 10 to 12 parts per thousand. So freshwater fish is about one-third the saltiness of seawater. And, and so this is just kind of a rule of thumb that, that 
fish people that we use to uh, you know just think about these in a standard manner I guess now if you look at a marine bony fish so a bony fish that lives in the ocean it also has about the same osmolarity of the freshwater bony fish it's about one-third as salty as the the ocean and so that makes the but because that so so both bony fish both the freshwater bony fish and the marine bony fish their internal environment is about the same salinity but they live in different external environments the freshwater fish lives in freshwater so the freshwater fish is hypertonic to its environment the marine bony fish has the same internal environment but it lives in a very salty place so the marine bony fish is hypotonic to its environment that means water is constantly leaving the marine bony fish and salts are constantly trying to get in right just the opposite problem of the freshwater fish so they must constantly drink water because they're always losing water to the environment but what would happen to you if you personally drank salt water all the time? Of course, this is always the problem of castaways and people that are, you know, um, shipwrecked and things like that. If you run out of fresh water, you're surrounded by water, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink, right? If you start drinking salt water pretty quickly, you're going to go insane and you're going to die very quickly right and that's because you have evolved in an environment um, you know in a very different environment where you're hypertonic to the environment um, you cannot get rid of all those extra salts but a marine bony fish that has evolved in this environment can handle all those extra salts and so again you know when you start drinking salt water Okay, yeah, you're taking in water, but you're taking in way more salt than your body's designed to deal with, and you can't uh, excrete it fast enough. And so then your neurons start to get messed up, and your your ion levels get messed up, and your kidneys get messed up, and you know it doesn't take very long at all for you to to uh, go crazy and die. So you know the water is fine; it's the salts that are getting you. Uh, okay, and so here's a figure from your book again, kind of demonstrating a marine bony fish. Um, and all the different strategies that the marine bony fish uses because it's hypotonic to its environment. So, excuse me, but the ducks are here. Oh, here, say hi. Say hi, guys. And look, there's their pan that's empty. So, I'm going to take a time out. Gonna go feed my ducks. Be right back. Okay, sorry about that, but uh, I know the ducks will not shut up until I feed them. And so now we're looking again. We're looking at a, a marine bony fish, and there's lots, you know, of, of again, there's a, an overall lots of components to the overall strategy for maintaining a constant environment in this very salty water. They've got to constantly drink because they're constantly losing water. Uh, they've got the salt is keeps coming into their body so they've got ways to get rid of excess salt and so they got a lot of salt in their poop um, they're constantly drinking but they have very concentrated urine um, uh, because they you know they're constantly losing water other ways and so the urine instead of being dilute is very concentrated there's not a lot of water but there's a lot of salt in that urine again because you're trying to get rid of salt and and retain water um, and then, whereas the freshwater fish pumps salts in at the gills, the marine fish pumps salt out. And it's the same kind of pumps, they just got reversed. And so they probably started that way in the marine fish, and then when fish evolved in freshwater, they you know, just flipped the, the, uh, the pump, and now they could pump the salts in. Now, um, 
there are different types of fish and there's another group of fish called the cartilaginous fish right so when you think of a fish and the ones we showed you you kind of think of typical fish it's, it's what we call a bony fish and those are the most common fish on earth there's 30 or 40 thousand species of of bony fish on earth but there's also cartilaginous fish your sharks skates and rays right and you're familiar with sharks for sure and they're not as common and you know they have a common ancestor with other fish that goes way back so they're kind of a very different group and they have a slightly different strategy although they live in the same environment they live in the ocean <coughs> again they have similar salt levels to freshwater fish and, and other bony fish right so the salt levels are about the same but these cartilaginous fish then add extra things other than salts to their blood. They have lots of urea in their blood, which bony fish don't have. <coughs> excuse me, and they produce, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they produce a compound called TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. And this compound <coughs> doesn't seem to have any other metabolic function. It doesn't seem to do anything else for the cartilaginous fish it's just there in their blood <coughs> excuse me but um, these things make the blood even saltier because they've got the, the regular salts that other bony fish do but they have these extra things in their in their blood and so they're almost osmoconformers they've got all that extra stuff in their blood so they're less hypotonic than the bony fish and so they're almost osmoconformers and so that's part of their strategy they also have a, a specialized gland called a rectogland and this rectogland is designed to help excrete excess salt and so you know these are uh, a different group and they've got a different strategy for dealing with the same environment okay so that's a, a you know obviously aquatic organisms what about terrestrial vertebrates well you've got completely different problems than fish right now water loss is a very big deal water loss to a fish is not something they're they're more worried about salt balances because obviously they got all the water they need well in terrestrial vertebrates <coughs> to us uh, retaining water is a is a very big deal we don't have all the water that we need and so um, replacing lost water there's several ways you can drink duh um, there's lots of water in your food and so just by eating you're taking in water and then there's something called metabolic water that also can be very important so recall the Krebs cycle and recall that here and in other places you see where water's coming in and so this is one of many reasons why you need water so this is where you need water coming in but if you look at the end of the electron transport chain you'll recall that we pass those electrons to an oxygen right and so that oxygen then binds with a couple of protons to make a water molecule and that's like the last reaction in this whole elect the, the whole process of electron transport right and so the oxygen really really wants those electrons and it gets them but it can't just have a couple of extra electrons it needs to grab a couple of protons to make a water molecule then it's a stable molecule the bottom line is <coughs> is that the end product of this is that you're making new water molecules and that's metabolic water now again this is not water from the food like when you eat food there are water molecules you know i mean uh, to, to take an extreme example you'll think of eating a juicy peach right there's lots of water already in there that's not what we're talking about that's a source of water for sure what we're talking about is actually making new water um, using oxygen that's breathed in protons that are you know from the food or from whatever and electrons that come from the food <coughs> and using the energy from the food to end up making this water <coughs> all this talk of water is making my throat very scratchy <coughs> excuse me so that's what metabolic water is it's new water that's being created Damn. 
son of a bitch, why does my body do this to me? <clears throat> son of a goddamn bitch. <sighs> I can't fucking stand this. All I want to do is do my goddamn job. Okay, so here's an interesting figure from your book, and it's comparing humans to kangaroo rats. So kangaroo rats are rats that live in the desert in an extreme environment, and it shows you um, the you know the gains in water and the losses in water, and where those gains and losses are for both humans and the kangaroo rats. So for example, you know nearly half the water that we take in comes from drinking. Uh, but 40% comes from our food, and 12% is this water that we make at the end of the electron transport chain. And then, you know, we lose most of our water through urine and uh, evaporation, not only through the skin, you're sweating, but also, you know, when you breathe out, right? If you get in a car in, in, in winter, very quickly the windows fog up, right? You're breathing out a lot of, of water, and you lose very little in the feces. But compare that to the kangaroo rat, which lives in a very harsh environment, right? The kangaroo rat does not drink water. It gets 0% of the water it needs from drinking, which you know, makes sense because you live in a desert. But think about that. Think about an organism that does not drink. But it gets 90% of its water from dry seeds, from metabolic water. <clears throat> so again, it eats all these seeds and there's a little bit of water already in the seed. So 10% of the water that the rat needs, it is already in the form of water in the seed. But for the most part, those seeds are very, very dry. And where it gets the water it needs for its cellular processes is from breaking down those seeds, sending them through the electron transport chain, and then, and then building new water. That's crazy right and then you see it doesn't pee out very much water which makes sense you should retain that water if you live in the desert um, most of the water that it loses is through evaporation and and through the skin and also through breathing out uh, so it's very efficient about um, retaining water you know in the urine and in, in the feces so anyway i think that's just fascinating but these are all different strategies that organisms can use to maintain their salt and water balance. And so this is all part of homeostasis. And so then um, in the next lecture, we're gonna talk in a little bit more detail about um, <clears throat> what kind of organs we use to help with, you know, maintain this uh, salt and water balance. And so um, I guess I'll just see you then. So see you later.